So good afternoon once again, colleagues. You are welcome to today's CPD. And with me is Dr. Aisha Isaka. She will be the chairperson for today's program. And I am Dr. Brefwa Jemfirimpong. I'll be your moderator. Dr. Aisha, so can you please offer us, I think, give us a short prayer so that we begin the program? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brefo. Um, I'm Aisha Ali Isaka, a member of the CPD National, uh, GMA National. Um, we present to you our first um, CPD uh, by GMA National for the year. And um, we hope that um, it will be a very good one and the take home will also be very practical. People will learn, uh, leave the CPD empowered. Um, um, we will ask um, Almighty God to lead us in the discussions as um, our panelists take on, um, the speakers take on the topics and then our members also do the listening. Um, I would like to also give every um, all protocol observed, um, give you a good afternoon and um, welcome you all once again. So um, I'll hand over to Dr. Befo to take over as the moderator for the event. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. So today's theme is entrepreneurship among doctors and dentists. And we have two speakers who will be sharing their experiences as they've gone through this journey. They will share with us at least what they learned and so that we can employ them whenever we want to also start anything of ours from the scratch. So our first speaker is in the person of Dr. Padi Roland Ayete, who is an ONG specialist and an entrepreneur. He is the CEO of Elma Health and is a proud product of the University of Ghana. Dr. Paddy, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, and I hope, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yes, yes. I hope you are doing well. Yes, I'm well. Yes. Today, we are ready to learn from you the journey that you embarked on, how it has been. So we are ready. Kindly let us know what it entails. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Paddy. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'd like to share my screen. Um, I'd like to know if um, you can see my screen. Can you see my screen, please? Yes, boss, please, I can see. Dr. Med Paddy, yes, you can see. All right, then I shall continue. So my name is Paddy Aite. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, and I practice at Elimas Health um, in, in the city of Accra. Yeah. Okay. So before I start, um, this is my, let me just tell you a bit about myself and my journey in private practice. Uh, my first exposure to private practice was um, at the end of my house job, I was sitting in my flat. There was a knock on my door. A gentleman appears and he introduces himself and he tells me that um, he's looking for people to do a locum at his hospital. So I tell him that I'll go and take, I'll come and take a look the next day. So the next day, we schedule a time. I go there. I go around the hospital. He tells me what it entails. The slots are available with the uh, night slots for the weekdays. And then Saturday morning, afternoon, and night, and then Sunday morning, afternoon, and night. So I came and spoke to my friends, and four of us agreed to take the entire job. And so for about four years, we all worked there. We took care of all the slots, morning, afternoon, night, and all the weekends. And we made arrangements amongst ourselves. If one person couldn't cover, you would tell another person to go and cover. So sometimes you would do two, two, two shifts straight forward because your friend had another engagement. Um, it was quite an interesting experience for us. We learned quite a, a lot about how private uh, practices run. And I think it's helped us all in our development. Um, at the end of, I mean, all of us, the four of us have continued to be friends. And interestingly enough, um, I'm in private practice. One of them became the medical director for Kolebu Teaching Hospital. One became the head of the uh, anesthesia training school for nurses and nurses 
and the other one became the chief executive of, of Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Um, on behalf of myself and all those people, we'd like to thank Dr. Sisi Kwakun, who gave us our first introduction to of Northridge Clinic, our first introduction to private practice. He taught us a lot about life, a lot about business. He introduced us to Og Mandingo. He taught us about savings and investments. He made us put money in EPAC. So we are all very, very early members of EPAC. And it has been a lovely journey from now until then. So Dr. Kwakun, thank you very much. When I finished specialization, I, I knew I was going to leave Kolebu, but I had a client in Accra. So I opened up a small office practice. And it was, in the, it was at the Kolebu market area. We had got a shop there, had it partitioned, into, had an architect to redesign it. And out of that one shop, a corner shop, it was divided into a consulting room, an OPD, a lab, and a toilet. And we ran that for about a year. And uh, but when the numbers, and I'm, I like to look at the numbers, when the numbers were not looking too good after about a year, because I become more established in Tema, then I, we closed it down. And then I continued to work. Then I was working in Tema, and I was working also as a fee for service in some part, a few hospitals where I was rendering specialist service. So if they needed, a, if I had a clinic that I would run, and then sometimes they would call you to come in to um, do a surgery or see a patient. And that's essentially, I work, they give me a fee for whatever service that I, 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 I had performed. And that went on until I think 2009 when I set up my first hospital. And that, and at that point, I just, I just jumped in, both feet, sink or swim, in, fully committed. And I ran that practice for nine years. And then after nine years, I had some challenges, uh, partnership issues, and the long and short of it, I just felt the best thing was to leave and for my peace of mind. And so I did leave, and then I worked again as a fee for service for one and a half years, and then after that, set up an office practice. And I ran the office practice for another three years, and I've, second, I've just finished building the second hospital, which I am just soon will start um, um, running fully there. So I've had experience in you know different kinds of um, locum office practice, fee for service, running a hospital, uh, you know, and all combination of all, this, all those things. So my narrative is going to be from the experience that I've drawn from all these areas and to try and help you on your on your journey in case you decide to take this lovely but crazy journey that we have I have enjoyed uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, so the question is, what is your why? For those who do network marketing, this, this statement must be familiar. They ask you, why do you want to do this? Because your why determines your motivation uh, and that helps to define what you are going to do and how you are going to go about it. For some people, it's because they are going on retirement and they, they, you know, they fit 60, they are living public service, they are not too sure as to how they want to, if they want to continue in the public service. And so they decide that they want to invest in a small a clinic, small, big, whatever, for them to occupy their time while they are retired or to make a good living. It's not a bad reason, that, but if you are going to do that, my general recommendation is to start, don't wait till you retire, start a bit earlier because there are risks in using all your savings to stop something that you, do, you, you don't know whether it would, really, it would really work. A lot of businesses collapse in the first five years. In fact, majority do. So to be successful, you had better start whilst you have a different income. So, um, so, and figure out a way to make this thing work before you actually reach the retirement um, um, age. Starting after retirement can be risky. Um, yeah, funds financially, and then you also don't have the strength to be able to drive it and overcome the challenges and the time to catch up uh, on it. For some people, they want to, they want independence. And that is because where, where they are working, they are too regulated and too restricted and they are not able to practice the way they want to, to practice. And so they want a new place to be able to, um, to do that. Some others desire to leave an inheritance for their children. One of my colleagues told me that, hey, I'm spending all my time working in this place. I do get a salary. But at the end, when I retire, I have nothing to give to my children. And for that reason, I'm setting up, a, I need to start a practice now before I get to that age so that when I retire, I can leave something to my children. 
if your desire is to leave something to your children, you need to be really, really careful how you bring up those children. Paying plenty of money for them to go to school abroad is usually not a good idea if you want your children to come back and inherit whatever you are building. It's something that a lot of Ghanaians do. And when you send your kids abroad, they don't learn the business. They don't learn how the money is made. They don't learn the struggle. They go out there, especially if they go out early, their friends are there, their life is there. They tend not to come back. And it's, it's funny. I see this among Ghanaians sending their children out because they've got a lot of money or they've got a bit of money. And I see the Lebanese and their Indians keeping their children right beside them. And from the age of 14 or 15, incorporating them in the business. And they move on to second generation and third generation and fourth generation. And we are still struggling to have second generation businesses owned by, by, by Ghanaians. Ghanaian second generation businesses are rare and third generation businesses are almost extinct. So you need to think about how you are bringing up those children that you intend to leave the inheritance to. I've told my kids, if by 65 I'm not conv convinced you can run it, I will sell it and chop my money. A better life. You, for some people, it's because they want to have a better work-life balance. And for others, it's because they want to have a, return, a better return on efforts. My reason for setting up was in part because I wanted a better return on efforts. I realized that if I worked and I did 10 season sections and my colleague came tomorrow and did two, we were paid the same amount of money. If I was diligent in my cases and he was not, we are paid the same amount of money. And I didn't think that was fair for me. I mean, somebody else has different reasons. I felt that the harder I worked, the more compensation I should receive. Years ago, we went on duty. And uh, this was years ago, I was in residency. And I was doing surgical rotation. And we had finished a surgical shift. And one of our colleagues at that time, who was not from Kolebu, but was doing residency in Kolebu, said he was going to buy a crate of malt to his family to compensate them for you know, being away over the night. And those of us who are residents there could not afford to do the same thing. And we're like, we are all doctors in this country. You go on duty at night, and there are not enough packs. And the person who should release the pack is asleep. Why do I have to struggle for him to sleep? Not fair. So a lot of those things got into, and I hate hearing it being evil, personally. I'm, why? It's somebody's job to ensure that the thing is there, so I do my work. And I can't control that person. I can't sack that person. I can't ensure that the things are there. It was frustrating for me. And that was part of the reason why I decided that, you know something, let me take my fate into my own hands. So, in case, whatever reason you've decided to set up a clinic or a hospital, you have decided. These are the problems that are going to face you. Or shall I say, these are the challenges that you must solve. What type of clinic? Who will be your clientele? Where will you put it? How will you finance it? Should you rent or should you build? Should you construct from scratch or, sh or should you convert? Where will you get equipment from and how much would you spend on it? Where do you get staff? What are the regulatory hurdles you have to jump? Which are the special services that you need to engage? Health and safety issues, which is big for factories and hospitals. Fees, charging, what should I charge? What is the return of investment? And what are the pitfalls that you may encounter along the way? So let's see type of hospitals or type of clinical practices. You can have an office practice. Um, there are a couple in this town where it's a small of an office with a, 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 a consulting room, a, a, a waiting area with a, a secretary and receptionist, um, somebody to collect fees, maybe a small room to draw samples, and essentially that's it. And uh, that is more like the American model, where you see your doctor in one place, but you go on admissions in a different place. So they've got large hospitals where all the doctors admit, but the doctors themselves have got small, small offices that are near the hospital or in town, and they have admission privileges in, in, in the hospital. You can have what we typically call a clinic, which is like an outpatient facility. Um, you might have a small room where you can do some small minor procedures, or you can have a clinic that has a fully ambulatory surgical unit where your clients can come in have procedures done or even surgeries done, and when they finish, they go home the same day. Or you can have what we call what we really describe as a hospital: admission beds, um, theater, multiple services, you know, CSSD, all those things. And even with those various types of um, kinds of arrangements, you can have a clinic that sees all kinds of patients as a, as a general practice clinic. You can have a specialty practice where you see only your specialty. 
you can have a multi-specialty practice where the facility allows you to see different specialties in the same location, but doesn't necessarily need mean you admit. You can have a group practice where you have a lot more people coming together to work together. And sometimes it is different, different people, even in the same specialty, working as a group. Or you can have a combination of all these things in, in, in one place. Clientele, who exactly is your target market? And your target market actually determines a lot of things. Do you want to be specialist, multi-specialty, general practice, a combination of both? Are you seeing upper class people, middle class people, NHIS people, or all? You'll be surprised that these categorization determines the fittings that you use for your facility. There are some fittings that if you use for NHS facility, NHIS facility, you will go broke in no time. If you use those same fittings in an upper class community, your clients will leave you. Are you looking after males, females, children, or you cannot be all things to all people. You have to decide what your clientele, the kind of clientele you are going to serve and really focus, target them in how you do your setup. Location. Location matters. In business, they'll tell you location, location, location. In hospitals too, your location matters. The closer you are to the client, the easier it is for the client to see you. So if you put, you have to determine, you, you really have to be careful where you put your, 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 your facility. You have to look at the kind of clients you intend to serve, where they are aggregated, how easy it is for them to get to you, and then you locate your facility in that, in that area. I've had clients that are sent to other regions for services. That is because those people have got a, special, a certain specialty that I couldn't find anybody nearby to do. I had to spend time and effort convincing those clients. And when they traveled there, they appreciated the skill that a doctor had and the results that they got, even though the environment might not have been what they are used to. You can only do that if you have special, special skills. So for special, special skills, you can be distant from where your clients are. They will still come. They don't have a choice. If they want that level of service, you have it. However, if you're in general practice, there are multiple alternatives between wherever you are positioning yourself and where your client is coming from. And the further you are from them, the more you discourage them from actually traveling that distance to come and see you. Even specialty service, people complain about the distance, especially if it requires, uh, in my area where the patient comes to see you, it's not like sick, sick, she's not dying. She's got options. She may decide that, ah, it's too far, I won't come because what, uh, until a crisis happens, she realizes, oh, I wish I went here instead of there. But other than that, they see that, oh, I can come here, I can come here. So the one who is closer tends to get a, a bit more traffic if his service is, is, is comparable. Access to public transportation matters for clients who have got no cars. So if you are the NHIA or the uh, lower middle class or lower class people, recognize the fact that you need to be close, your location needs to be close to public transportation. If you are far from public transportation, they won't come. You will struggle. For those who have cars, on the other hand, parking matters to them because their cars are nice and expensive and they want to be able to put their car, have their cars being safe and not parking by roadsides where they will get scratched. If you don't have, if you are in that part of town and you don't have parking, it will be an issue. Also, you must also remember that rents or land varies per location. In some area, they just tell you this, this is the cost for that land or this is the rent for some that building. In other areas, they charge you per square meter. So location matters and actually affects the amount of your business. Financing. How are you going to finance this project? For most of us, it is our savings. So it's really important that if you intend to start on this journey, you save as much money as you can until you get to that point. Because those savings reduce the amount of money that you borrow. And the less you borrow, the less you owe people and the more control you have of your circumstances. Now, usually, typically, your savings will not be enough. And then we come to the three Fs. And the three Fs will support you. And they will push you even further on that journey. Those three Fs are family, friends, and what we call fools. Your family will support you. Maybe they won't. Your friends who believe in you will support you. And the fools are the people who are neither family nor friends. But when they listen to what you have, they are convinced that even though you have no business experience and you don't have any, um, demo, you haven't done this kind of thing before, they should invest in this business that you are trying to set up. And, and those people are indeed very helpful. 
yes, they call them fools because if you look at it from the, the maths, they shouldn't be trusting you with their money. But somehow they do trust you with their money. And if you've worked hard and you're able to deliver and give them results for it, their trust was worthwhile. Several years ago, when uh, Jeff Bezos was setting up Amazon, he spoke to his family and asked them to, rep to, to support him in the venture. And he offered them, I think, 10% for $50,000 each. His siblings did give him the $50,000 each. And it's, it is said that if they haven't sold their shares, each of them is worth over a billion dollars. Investments do work out with the right kind of people in the right kind of supports. But those are the people that indeed you can uh, 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 fall onto. You also know that those people, when you lose their money to, they won't come and kill you because, yeah, they are family or they trust you or they believe in you. You can take partners to set up the business. With partners, it means that maybe two or three or four of you come together to set up this project. We are each bringing our savings to set up the project. We may, after bringing up the, 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 our savings, work in the business or not work in the business. Those who are working in the business take salaries. Those who are not working in the business will take profits and dividends. Um, um, partners can be helpful. And if three people are bringing all their savings together, it just may be enough to set up the facility uh, uh, that you require in full. Um, then there's the bank. Uh, as you can see, your clinic is in most likely a startup. And banks do not invest in startups. But the bank will make you write a business plan. And don't give you money, no matter how nice your business plan is. The bank will ask for collateral. And you may have the collateral. They still won't give you money, no matter how good your business plan is and your collateral is. The bank will ask to see your cash flow, which you don't have. Because you are now starting your business. So you have a business plan, you have a collateral, but because it's a new business, you don't have cash flow, they will not give you money. In fact, banks typically only give you money when you don't need it. But when you need the money, they will not give it to you. So please don't expect that your bank is going to be raising money. Uh, uh, you, can, you can raise money from your bank. It is not a good idea. You'll be disappointed and you'll go through all kinds of iterations. You can go and take a personal loan. They will look at your salary and maybe give you a loan. But if you are going to do it for your business, they are typically not very supportive. I went to my bank. I wanted to buy a, a powerful ultrasound machine. I got, uh, uh, I went to, the, the company was willing to give me the machine with the, on a 90 day letter of credit. I only need to pay 10%. I went to the bank and told the bank that, hey, you take my cash every day. You pick up my cash every day. I want you to give me a letter of credit for the machine. It will be shipped in three months. I want that every day when I give you money, take part of that money and put it into account specifically towards the machine. And in three months, when the machine is going to be shipped, whatever money or, or delivered, whatever money that I don't have up to the, that is remaining, that I don't have, I want you to give me that difference as the loan and use the machine as security. The bank did me go come, go come, go come, go come, and didn't give me the loan. I got angry. She wired the company 50% of the money. Company wired the money and gave the, the machine, they said shipped me the machine and gave me six months to pay the rest. I paid the rest and dug the bank. I was going to buy a car. They did not give me the money until the car arrived in the country. Then I took the car to the bank and told them, I don't want your money anymore. Here's the car. Then they said they'll give me the money. That they sold the loan in the books. So I beg you, you take the money. I said, I don't want the money again. Keep it. Here's the car. I bought it. But the banks are not there to help you. Don't rely on them. Later when I told another banker, they're like, oh, we could have helped. Oh, if only we had known. Nonsense. They'll come and do the same thing to you. But of course, why should he give you a loan, a loan and take a risk at 30% when he can give the money to government and take 26% risk? Ah, for a lot of them, they think about it and like, ah, what's the point? Government before DDE is a guaranteed payer. You, we are not too sure whether you pay, so they rather give the money to government. So investors, they are people who are willing to invest in your business and they will take a cut of your business. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 55% of your business. Be careful how much you give away in this transaction. Because if you give too much away, you will no longer have a business. They will have a business. 
and you'll be working for them. All you have is a job, a new job. They are investors. And if the investor is coming to invest in your company, you need to discuss the exits. How does he exit? Because you can decide that we are going onto the stock market and that is when you, how you exit. You can decide that we are not going onto the stock market, but you give me the permission to buy your shares at the value of the shares at the time that, uh, of the company, at the time that you are exiting. A lot of those companies will exit in five to seven years. Yes, no, they have a five to seven year funding cycle. And then you have to get permission to be allowed to put money in a sinking fund to allow that fund to accumulate, to pay them off when they are leaving. All these, you need as much advice as possible if you are bringing in investors. Take note, when it comes to investment, that is their game. You, you know medicine. They, they know investment and money. And if you don't get good advice, they will play you. And in the end, you'll be working for them. If you really want, if and just ask the old people what happened to our, our the insurance that GMA um, people set up, health insurance years ago, and what happened eventually to it. You need to know how their game plays, but most importantly, you need to know get the best kind of advice as to how to play to to play in that field. So that's to do with investment investors. Then there are funding ag agencies, um, the Medicare Credit Fund does some funding for hospitals. They tend to do it for established hospitals who wish to expand rather than brand new hospitals that wish to start. But they are more understanding than um, than a lot of these other places uh, are. Uh, the problem is that their funds go through a bank. The bank puts their margin on it. And I've had arguments with the bank that the money is risk-free to you. It's not your money. You are just facilitating it. And you are still charging as high interest. But uh, yeah, that's the nature of our market. So... Uh, um, they are also an option um, to find money. So you have to decide, do you want to rent or do you want to build? So I've got a table here that gives you an example of, you know, an idea as to what exactly you're going to deal with. Um, the startup cost for renting is lower. The startup cost for building is definitely higher. Rent is month to month uh, or year to year. And you know you pay the rent, you get access to the building, and you can actually start working. If you have, if you want to build your facility, it will take you I don't know, maybe two years, three years, four, maybe five. I think our first facility took four years to build, and you know sometimes it takes a very long time just to kind of build uh, the, the the facility. But if you are renting the space, in our office practice, we rented we got the space, and in thirty days we had done all modifications and moved in and started our clinic. I think in both of them, we're able to do that. Now about 30 days. Um, flexibility of design is restricted in the rental space. What you have is what you have. If you, are, if you have a long lease, you have permission to make some modifications. If you have a short lease, I'm sorry, you don't have that permission. Whereas if you are building from scratch, you can do the custom builds and then design it every way um, you want. If you are renting, you have no equity in the building. And so you cannot use that collateral for a loan. If you are build the building it is yours forever unless you use a collateral for a loan and the bank takes it from you but you are you're allowed to use a collateral for a loan to either expand the building reinvest in it buy equipment equity release you have more options if you own the building if you are renting you have got multiple locations that you can set up your clinic because there are always rental spaces in town the question is whether you like the location if you can afford it and if the building can be modified to your needs without spending too much money on the other hand, if you want land in that location, it may be bloody expensive or not available at all. And so building becomes uh, a more tedious and more expensive option. Um, you do have to also have a, uh, even if you are going to construct, you have, to, you have to decide whether you can take a building and take a long lease from that building. And that means the person allows you to modify it. If you have 15 years on the building, a 15 year lease, 20 year lease on the building, you can do all kinds of crazy modifications that you want. As long as you you can you are willing to give it back to the landlord the way you met it, or leave your modifications for him to enjoy. So um, that is what you have to decide on. If it's your own land, you can do anything you want with it, but the land can be bloody expensive because you have to raise that the money in full upfront, unlike a situation where you are paying like annual um rents or leases for the area that you have you have. Um, you, you are either way if you're going to construct or convert a property you need a good architect and please get a good architect
not your friend, not your something. Preferably get a recommendation to get a good architect. I find a situation where I build, then I ask somebody else to take a look and a person pointed out to me that this corridor is not straight. So if you have a trolley, you cannot maneuver this curve into this room. I'm like, crap. My architect didn't see it. I didn't see that. Um, I, uh, because of the nature of this building, you don't have space for a ramp. You need to put an, ele an elevator because you need an elevator, not a ramp. I'm like, ah, ah, okay. I didn't realize. There are all kinds of things that come up if you are using the right architect and the same applies to the contractor. A contractor can tell you that within your, with, the, with the kind of thing that you are doing, the kind of soil that you have, it is not advisable to do A, B, C, or D. When I was building a current project, we dug really deep into the ground. The soil tests, you have to do a soil test before you start. The soil test said we should dig, I think, some meters. Contractor said no, he was going beyond that. So he actually went beyond that. I have enough space on the ground to put in a basement. So come and see my two noon. I said, oh, we should consider putting in a basement and blah, blah, blah. The guy was like, oh, cool, we can do it. I said, uh, what's the water table? Water table is high. That means if I do a basement, I have, I'll be fighting water all the time because the damp is going to rise. And uh, what about my walls? Oh, we will have to use concrete um, walls. Uh, how am I going to do damping, damp proofing? Oh, you have to damp proof the entire place. But because of the way it is, you need to put in sums to be pumping out water. Uh, at that point, I told him, so how much are this going to cost? He says, a lot of money. I said, it's okay. I don't do the basement again. One of my colleagues has spent enough money for his basement that I think can do two floors. And that's just basement. Um, I think you, I said, doctor, you will come up with what your idea is. Please have a contractor and architect who will tell you this is how much it will cost. Mind you, you always tell me, what you are saying is how much it will cost. Are you ready? And when I look at the cost, I say, I don't want it again. It's okay. Let's, let's move on. If I really want it, I insist. But other than that, you know, you have to, um, you have to have people who will give you good counsel. Otherwise, you will spend money in places you shouldn't spend. Basements are very expensive and very difficult to maintain. Um, you need a waste management specialist because our waste at the hospital are unique. If you had to, you, I mean, you can't just put your stuff into the gutter. The best if you get if you have a bad digester that allows you to get reproduce clean water at the end of your digestion process, it's a whole lot better than actually putting your drain straight into the water because your neighbors can start complaining that red things are flowing or smelly things are coming out of the of, of, of your location. And that is where EPE will enjoy themselves at your at your um, yeah, expense. You need a medical gas specialist who is going to ensure that you have the right amount of your, your medical gas system works. And there are rules and regulations for those for those things. Um, ideally, you should have a, a gas plant outside that pipes your gas into the room so that at the various points in the room, you can actually just plug into the wall and get your oxygen. You need to have an oxygen bank at the back and a method of monitoring the, this thing. So we have the controls on each floor that if the oxygen is low, it starts beeping. It does oxygen, it does vacuum at the same time. And um, you've got gas, um, a, a port that expels out the use anesthesia gas from the rooms. And these are either connected to direct to the wall or you have a headboard. Those things cost money. You need to have somebody who knows what he's doing, who can give you the right kind of setup to ensure that these facilities are there and done well. If you are doing a multi-floor um, um, system, that means you need an elevator. The elevator, de de depending on who you contract, will come early or come late. There are some contractors in this town that are notorious for never delivering on time. There are also some contractors that will deliver on time, but they are notorious for not installing on time. Uh, please get recommendations if you intend to put in a, an elevator so that you you will have peace. And that brings us to contract management. There are multiple people you are going to deal with. Architect, contractor, electrical services, plumbing, structural engineer, um, um, uh, 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 elevator guy, medical gas guy. Um, one of the things I have learned is that you should put penalties in your contracts for failure to deliver. Because they never deliver on time, ever, ever. I have a particular contractor. I think he's the most popular guy in this town. He's got like 200 jobs at the same time. And getting him to come and finish your one job is very difficult. The last time I gave him penalties that he lose a thousand CDs a day for not coming to my site. Uh, I think he motivated him a bit more than, than, than in times past. But, you know, some of them, they just don't care.
So you need to manage your contracts properly and preferably put somebody on the spot to sit on it and help you to, to make it work. Um, equipment. You are going to buy equipment at some point. I'll suggest that you buy for longevity and buy reliable brands that preferably have after sale support so that if you have a problem, they are in town to fix it for you. I'll suggest that you buy in stages and as needed. Sometimes you can buy things that we don't need right now. And we bought it because it was available. We thought we need it in future. Meanwhile, you need money to pay your contractor or your tiler. You haven't paid your tiler and you're going to buy a, a, a CT scan. It doesn't work that way. So really buy as and when you need. Um, negotiate payment terms. A lot of them would give you the equipment on payment terms, uh, especially the established ones, and say, pay this amount, we'll give it to you over the next few months you pay. Please pay as you have said you will pay. Because if you pay as you have said you will pay, they'll give you the next one. You paying on time is not because you are a fool. It's because you intend to buy another one from him tomorrow. And he will look at your payment terms to give you the next one. Otherwise, you end up going from contractor to contractor, trying to get a deal from different different people. Eventually, your reputation goes around. Everybody knows that you, won't, uh, you, you don't pay. So there are some people. They'll come to me and tell me, oh, I went to this guy's pay. He doesn't pay, so I won't do a, a job for him. My, my, oh, this guy, what's he called? The guy who did my um, distant work. This steel thing that they put on the building. Um, he, he was working for some guy. And then he discovered that the guy has not got a reputation for paying. Waited one week, two weeks, the guy didn't pay. He dismantled the equipment and took them to el elsewhere for the person to work, to work for somebody who was willing to pay. If you get that kind of reputation, it will be difficult for you to get jobs done. Um, I, I was once at a place where, uh, in a hospital, where the cleaner, they had a problem with the plumbing and they told the cleaner to call the plumber. And the plumber went, and uh, the, the cleaner fixed the problem without calling the plumber. So the owner got up to give the plumber some money and somebody hit his hand so that he doesn't give the plumber the money. Unfortunately, the, the cleaner, the money, the plumber didn't come. Unfortunately, the cleaner noticed that he was going to be rewarded for his service and somebody stopped the reward. The next time the thing got blocked, they called the cleaner to fix it. He says, oh, he can't fix it. Cleaner went and called the plumber. Negotiated with the plumber before the plumber came. The plumber charged for himself and the cleaner. Please, amongst your workers, have a good reputation because half of them already want to rob you. Don't give them an excuse to rob you more. So build long lasting relationships, suppliers, workers, everybody, please have a good reputation with them. If you are borrowing, be careful about interest rates. It is actually ridiculous to borrow at 30% for any kind of productive activity in this country, because 30% means that in three years, you will owe hundred percent on top of the amount you borrowed. Be very, very careful if you are borrowing. Also be aware of latest technology when you are buying things, because uh, sometimes the additional value that you are paying because of the latest technology is found to be useless two, three years down the line. And then there's no point in the money that you paid. And also remember that used equipment also work. Not everything has to be new. There are some things you must insist on them being new. Some things don't have to be new. If they, if they're in good shape and you've got a good service team, please, you can buy used. It's not by force. Nobody, you don't owe anybody. Staffing, my time is running out. Staffing, always be on the lookout for possible recruits, no matter where you go. Be on the lookout for you know, people who can give you good service. If they give you good service anywhere, that person is a potential recruit. Uh, just don't poach your colleague staff, uh, it, it's not nice. Uh, it, it, for good harmony, don't poach your colleague staff or your colleague's patients. Uh, there's enough for all of us. We've got plenty of people who don't, who don't have um, jobs. You can always find um, um, good recruits. Find good managers who will help you with recommendations of good people. I have one of my staff whose biggest asset to me is she knows how to find good people. She'll come and tell me, I've met this person somewhere. And I think this person, you need to hire the person. I'm like, why? A, B, C, D, E. Smart is this, is diligent is that. I'm like, oh, okay. So when the opportunity comes and the person comes looking for a job, that person almost automatically is going to get a job because this person only recommends good people to me. 
And every single person this person has recommended to me has been good. In fact, I should pay that person a salary just for recommendation so that every day just recommend people because I've been saved a lot of headache because of that. When it comes to nursing recruitment, it is my recommendation to allow the nurses to manage their own thing because if you can never understand whatever it is yeah, they do. I, in my current recruitment, my nurses, my nursing team and my business development people, they recruited the nurses. And there are like two or three people that they recruited that when you see them, they don't look very impressive appearance wise, but they are my hardest working, most committed people. Most committed people. One of them came to work four days, for four days continuously, before the day she was actually supposed to go start her work. So she started duty on Tuesday. She came to work on Friday, came to work on Saturday, came to work on Sunday, and came to work on Monday. Meanwhile, her shift starts on, 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 on Tuesday. And on each day, left after 6 p.m. Amazing human being. I didn't recruit her. My nursing team did. And whatever they saw that they used to recruit her, I wouldn't have seen it in her face. But she's an excellent staff. Um, you need to recruit doctors. Um, plenty of recommendation. Find out people who, you know, know somebody who can work hard. Um, and if they are not delivering service, please move on to the next. Um, we have a current problem where we've got a batch of people who are waiting for posting. The challenge is that you recruit them, you train them, and when they get the training and they are now useful to you so you can sleep, then government gives them posting and then they disappear. I'm sorry, it's the way of the world. We can't do anything about it, or we can't do much about it. You just have to get used to it. It doesn't mean that we'll stop recruiting, but we need to keep that in mind, that it, with this situation, some will leave. So you need to be in a continuous recruiting process you know, all, all, all the time. So that is that. You also need laboratory technicians. You need sonographers, radiographers, and, and all extras. You need cleaners. You need security. You need accountants. You need insurance staff. If you are doing insurance, you need to have somebody who is dedicated just to manage your insurance. The paperwork with insurance is annoying and a lot. And this is for money that doesn't come on time. So you really need to be sure have somebody who whose job is to process your insurance um, um, claims and keep track of them. The insurance companies have this beautiful trick. You send them a bill for 100000 and then they pay 42 And then you start arguing with them on the remaining 50-something, um, 50 58. Then they pay 12000 Then you are you know debating on them on the rest of it. Then you send your next bill of 40000 and they pay twenty. And then you start arguing, then they pay eight. Before you are aware, you've forgotten how much they owe you. And then in the end, they get away with it. If you are doing insurance, any type of insurance, private or public, have somebody whose job is to keep their eye on the ball all the time. Otherwise, you lose a lot of money. There's an insurance company in America who routinely cancels 40% of all claims. It cancels it. It just cancels it. 40% of all claims, you cancel it so that you must now come and defend that 40%. It is a strategy not to pay. And you also have to take a decision. Will you take insurance or not? I haven't taken insurance in four years. I haven't taken any insurance in four years. So like, some people where they are, the only people who come there are people who take insurance, people who have insurance be it NHIA, and I'll talk about NHIA a bit and its impact on, uh, on us when it comes to charges. And then even with private insurance, I have survived without private insurance. In fact, the insurance companies come to me all the time and I tell them, what is in it for me? My patients are paying me right now. If they now pay through you, I get your numbers, you give me your numbers, it runs down my services and you pay when you want. So I don't get my money when I need it. What is the advantage? Eventually, I may take one or two companies, but for now, you know, they need to justify why I need to take them. And if I can survive without them, I would. Because they are not very nice. However, some of the companies are good, so I won't say all are bad. You just need to know how you're going to manage them and uh, with your involvement with them. Regulatory. Hmm. This is where it gets interesting. So for this is assembly, business operating permits, you have to pay them 
every year. And they, the figure is supposed to be in a book. The book, they will show you. And every year, they dream a figure and they just slap a figure. So the fee should be maybe 400, 500. They'll come and tell you it's 1,003. And give you a woman number that you must pay to. Or something. Please, don't people try and pay them by a check. They get very frustrated when you give them checks. Because it means money cannot be, you know, is handled. It, it can't be diverted. But business operating permit, every year they will come. Uh, it is good for you to know how much it is they charge and pay them. Uh, just get them off your back, pay them. If you are using a building, you need a building permit from those same people. Building permit now, they want to see ownership of the land as part of the documentation and then to add it to their planning and things of that sort. Uh, be kind to those people. They can frustrate you. So the building permit people, they have to be your friends. Uh, you also need, if you're changing the use of the building, you need to be friends with them. So this thing. I discovered that your company car that has your company logo and things on it, to the assembly, it's as, it is, uh, what do they call it? Advertising. They'll charge you for it. So when they come and they see you, don't be surprised when they tell you they'll charge you. It's about 200 and something CDs. It's not that much. Sometimes it's not worth the fight. You just pay and collect your receipt and have your piece of mind. Fire service. You need, first of all, a whole book. That fire service, uh, for the fire service to get your, to get your permit. Uh, thankfully, fire service has got approved contractors that will help you write your book. So usually they recommend one for you. You go in, they write your book for you for a fee, and then you submit your fire plan, and then you get your permit. Your extinguishers, every year they'll come and inspect. They may even sell you some. I think fire service is quite proactive. They give you the regulations. They help you to meet the regulation, and you and them are fine. And then every year, they'll come and train you how to put out fires. And there's a fee for that too. So they'll come to your premises with your headpan, small fuel, put a fire, put it off. Everybody comes, stands around. And they say, you've had your training for the year until next year when they visit you again. Please make sure your permits are up to date all the time. Do it. Get it done. Not too much money. But if you do it, you have peace. Somebody can worry you because of this unnecessary. Of course, have read that certification of your location. Yeah. Uh, Currently, we have an imminent fight with HEFRA because HEFRA plans for everything like it's a public hospital. And they've, in their plan, the, the, the most recent regulation we saw says that if you don't have 20 beds, you can't do admission. And we told them you are not serious. So we have a, we are negotiating with HEFRA. Hopefully that shall be dealt with because it makes no sense. The HEFRA model does not have the office party, all those things inside though. It is, uh, what do they call it? Chips compound, uh, what? Polyclinic, I think, hospital, you know, that kind of structure. So that is a work in progress. And they they they, they, list, they do listen. You are you are required to register with the National Health Insurance Authority. Authority. If you intend to take private insurance. Uh now HEFRAS inspection and NHI inspections are being similar. So they are trying to merge it so that one person will inspect for both. Uh, that is going on right now. But once that is done, hopefully it will reduce our, our, our distant burden by, by, by one. Otherwise, you need to do HEFRA inspection. And then after that, NHI needs HEFRA inspection before they'll do NHI inspection. Oh, by the way, HEFRA needs EPA and FIRE before they'll do HEFRA. Then NHIA needs HEFRA before they'll do NHIA. So, you know, it follows like that. Just, the idea is have somebody who is who does compliance in your company whose job is to chase all these people it, it would be good for you if you chase it yourself you'll get very frustrated uh, the DC health office wants reports and epi supplies they also say they want um hefra before they remind you it's quite interesting standards board may appear and ask you for certification of your equipment that is another one data protection agency um they say you are managing patients data Therefore, you have to register with them and pay an annual fee. Please, all this I'm mentioning, their fees to be paid. Though. So that day too, you have to um, sort them out with their fee, annual fee because to help for permission to manage people's data. And then at the bottom, we have GRA, which requires a special section on its own. And of course, our Ministry of Health, who is our overall regulator. I shall talk further about GRA in a minute. So special service, you need a bookkeeper who takes your daily bookkeeping. And then you need an accountant who manages the books that the bookkeeper keeps. Then you need an auditor who audits what the accountant has done. Then you need a system by which you record your, your medical records, be it electronic or paper. You need to have a system that works. And then you need preferably 
a software for your pharmacy. Thankfully, some pharmacy softwares are available and that would allow you to manage your stock a whole lot better because stock management is the biggest downfall of a lot of hospitals. You can make losses just because your stock um, um, is, is, is poorly managed or things are going on there that you are not aware of. So you need to engage people in all these special areas. Of course, you need to have health and safety um, um, uh, um, policies. Remember that you need to have a nurse call for the client so that in an emergency, the client can press a button and the nurse call must also be in your bathroom. You need to have those assistance bars in the bathroom so that in case a client falls down or is disabled, they can lift themselves up in your in the bathroom. I hope I'm still being heard. You need to have, I, I, I trust I'm still heard. Hello? You are heard, Dr. Aite. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Hey, five minutes more is like two hours ago. Okay, I'll go faster. You need to have disabled access ramps to enter the building. You need to have a sewage disposal system that works and works properly. You need to have a system by which you dispose of your medical waste. Um, EPA will ask you. You need to have wet floor signs so that nobody stumbles and falls when they are in your premise. Um, charges. Choose the market you wish to address and then price accordingly how you are going to do this thing. Competing on price is a risky strategy and um, you may not have as deep pockets as the other person who is competing with you on price. You will not survive. So it's always careful. You have to be careful that you compete on something else other than price. Cost your services before you set your charges. Recently, as part of the private practitioners um, finance committee, I taxed everybody to give me the information they have in their facility with reference to their cost for only their OPD. And then we discovered that one of the institutions, his costs for providing care with a small margin is 93 CDs per patient. He charges 60. Another person should charge a minimum of 390 CDs to be able to break even with a small margin on their clinic at their OPD. Another person should be charging 150 and is charging 100 CDs. We can't set up charges arbitrarily without actually doing calculations to know how much does it cost me to render this service. And I think that's one of the biggest failings of doctors. In fact, when I presented the data at the last meeting, the our former national president, our former president told us that he's been looking for that data for years and nobody will give it to him. And how did I get the data? I think I said it was because of my smile. But I did get the data to be able to calculate. And I think everybody should be able to sit down and do their own calculations and know how much does it cost me to render this service, to be able to then say, this is how much I'm going to charge for the service. So it's really important. But you must remember something. All that money you took and invested in that hospital, you could have done something else with it. You could have bought a house and rented it out and collected rent for less headache. You could have bought government treasury bills, three months, three months, and got return on that money. Not government bonds, I beg you. But you could have done that. You could have decided to invest in a couple of Ubers and they bring you daily sales of whatever it is that they bring. You had a choice. I think it's important that you recognize the fact that this hospital you are investing in should bring you the kind of returns that you wish it to bring in addition to whatever emotional satisfaction that you bring. Otherwise, you are not making the most of your money. So get the kind of advice that you need. Don't invest in equipment or services just because others did. There's no need for you to buy a CT scan because your competitor has one. When your competitor has got a neuro clinic, an orthopedic clinic, uh, and well, I don't know, some other clinics that will determine that they need CTs and MRIs or maybe an MRI at you know a rapid rate. And you don't have those kinds of specialty services that need those, those kinds. And you have only one service and then you bought this machine and it doesn't bring you as much money. You think a CT scan is expensive, $500,000 to $1 million for one, but you forget the maintenance costs. MRI maintenance costs can be as high as $300,000 a year. Be, you have to be sure that you are using the money wisely. Do you have the market to justify that investment? You need to answer that question yourself. You also need to be able to know, ensure that the real estate you are using, the return is good. Quickly, GRE. These are the things you need to know about GRE. Proof of setup of funds. They'll ask you where you got the money from to start the business. You need to show that that money came from this account or that account. Have it. They will ask you when they do your first audit. Withholding tax. You need to withhold tax for, on every payment you make. It is either a goods or a service. There are different rates for different ones. On some of the vendors, you are paying the withholding tax because I tell you, the moment you ask him for withholding tax, he brings a VAT invoice and you pay 22%. It's sometimes wiser to pay the 3 or the 5% than the 22%. i am just letting you know. 
pay yourself first. If you don't pay yourself a salary, GRA will determine a salary and take the tax on the salary that you didn't take and charge you for it. So when they do your audit, it will come. If you have to you give money to your business, pay yourself the salary, deposit back into the company account to show that it's a loan to the company. Do not be late with filings. GRA expects you to do your filing and then make payments. If you make payment and you don't do filing, you pay penalty until the day they catch you. Even if you've made the payments and you have not made a filing, you pay penalty. So there's a limit, there's a deadline for filing, file. There's a deadline for payment, pay. Avoid their penalties at all costs because they accumulate and they multiply and the penalties exceed the crime very, very quickly. You've got estimated taxes. Every quarter, they give it to you, pay. You don't want to fight with GRA. Verify and pay your adjusted tax in December. So GRA tells you that within this year, you owe us 24,000. If by December you've, you've paid 24,000 and you check your books and you realize the fact that in actual fact, your money should be 36 and you don't pay the 36 in December, GRA next year will tell you that you should have paid the taxes in December and start calculating penalties on it. The problem with GRA is that they have the rule book. Only they know the rule book and they know what rule they pull at any time and they change the rules whenever they want. Be careful with GRA. Uh, you allow losses in the first five years beyond which they'll scrutinize you. You'll be audited once or maybe twice, at least once or maybe twice in your first five years. Prepare for that audit. Theft, document your transactions, trust but verify, involve yourself in vendor management, have a good accounting system, track daily your accounts, expenditure and distance C daily, weekly summaries, and monthly reports by accountants so that you will pick where there are problems and pick them up early. Malpractice, patients don't sue doctors they like. If they don't like you, they will sue you. It has nothing to do with your competence. It is they like you or they don't like you. They will sue you. Try and be nice. Take detailed notes on all interactions. Face-to-face -face consultations are better. Written communications all the time. Avoid con phone consultations, especially after hours, if you can't write notes. Explain to the patient that the cows come home. Consent, consent, consent. Kill problems, kill, kill problems quick. Get a good lawyer. And remember, the lawyer charges you irrespective of what, whether you are guilty or not. And you can be innocent and his fee is so high you are, you are better off paying the person to go than to pay the lawyer. So legal, yeah, we have something, is a, a headache that we all have. There are arguments about malpractice insurance, pros and cons. Problem with malpractice insurance is that if the client knows you have insurance, they sue you more. You've been warned. But if you don't have insurance and they sue you, you are paying from your pockets. Human resource is our biggest problem. It's a never ending problem. Um, get the best you can, keep them happy, pay as much as you can afford. Be careful with HR. Those HR people, I think they cause more trouble than they are, they are worth. But you have to be careful how you manage them. But sometimes they can cause trouble in a peaceful environment by what they say and how they manage certain situations. My final words. You have to choose a name for your business. And the name has to have not only meaning for you, but must be easy for the client to communicate or for you to explain. I would suggest that you choose a name that works for you and... Um, try and find one that you know you can do that you can work with. Partnership issues. It's a whole chapter about partnership. But I think before you set up a partnership, I would suggest you get a legal expert on partnership to set you up. Speak to all of you people, come to an agreement, plan exit, plan how to deal with problems and conflict resolution. I've enjoyed the joy of private practice. I have been enjoyed being able to provide service to my clients the way I want and when I want, with my level of expertise and comfort and pleasure. I have done my best to ensure that my clients, you know, enjoy the things that we have. And however, there are challenges. The joy for us has been that better return on effort or limited earning potential, better return on investment, master of your own destiny, you can leave an inheritance for your child. Challenges, you're on duty basically all the time. Whether you're on duty or the other doctors, they, they will call you. You can generate income, you have to generate income to pay others. When business is poor, you still have to find the money. You are personally and your company is personally liable. You have to deal with tax turnover and they're constantly increasing operating costs. My name is Padiaiti. I work at Ellis Mass Health. This is our admission facility, newly completed. And this is where I work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Med Padiroland Ayuti. This was such a detailed presentation. Thank you for presenting to us all that we need to know when we are trying to establish as in a facility. Thank you very much, Dr. Paddy. So up next, we are going to have a presentation on opportunities in agriculture. 
The presentation will be done by Dr. Medfred Bezra. Dr. Medfred Bezra is a family physician specialist and a farmer. He is a member of the Kriapa Koko Farmers Union. He helped design and implement a comprehensive primary care program for over 100,000 farmers. He also facilitated a telemedicine and community health worker program for the farmers in the remote in the remotest in the remotest part of Ghana. He is a product of Ken UST and Maoli Senior High School in Ho. Dr. Fred Bezra, good afternoon. Dr. Fred. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon Dr. Brifo, and thank you very much. And um, All right. thanks for the opportunity to share my experiences in farming with my colleague doctors. So, yes, I've started sharing the sharing my slides. I hope everyone can see. So, Dr. Fred, before you start, I would like to remember, uh, kindly remind uh, members that if they have any questions, they can type it in the Q&A session. And after all the presentations, we we'll read them out for the panelists to answer them. Thank you very much. You can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. So trying to look at the opportunities in agri for the medic is, is such a huge, huge, huge topic. To begin with, I don't even see why anybody would not want to invest in agriculture because everybody eats. We keep giving birth, we keep reproducing and the population is increasing. Everyone must be fed. And it's, a, it's such a huge and broad value chain that everybody would find something to do in agriculture. In fact, it's the oldest profession. That's the first profession God gave to Adam and Eve. And so it's, it's just imperative that we should all find some space within the agribusiness value chain. For starters, we are in Ghana and about 25% of our total GDP contribution is from agriculture. And it's the largest employer in Ghana. You don't need to be an agriculturist to venture into agriculture. If we even take, we even expand that data, I'm sure we would even have more than the 50% that we currently have. And the land is so fertile that virtually everything grows here and you can raise even any animal <laughs> you can think of in Ghana here. In terms of earnings, we are looking at $2.8 billion in 2020 and this has significantly increased over the past four years. Global situations have even compelled or have increased the need for us to look at agriculture and take agriculture very, very seriously. If for nothing at all, Ghana has very favorable climate and soil conditions to grow so many, a wide variety of food crops. That should be a reason why you should invest in agriculture. I mean, if I mean invest, it means you want to earn extra income. And Dr. Aite mentioned something that they were all doctors and then somebody bought mil malt and they couldn't afford. He chose the private clinic path to be able to afford the little things that he could not afford. And I can assure you that going through agriculture will definitely serve the same purpose, if not even better. There is a growing domestic demand for food. There's always shortage of food in the world. Every part of, there is always shortage of food. Even in Ghana, there's always shortage of food. International market, there's a huge demand for our products. Products from uh, the tropics. Then government is investing so much. Not just governments, our bilateral and multilateral partners are pushing in so much money into agricultural initiatives and the money is aligned there. I know so many of the MasterCard Foundation. I know 
uh, the Ghana Interpre Entrepreneurship Agency, they have so much money that nobody is assessing. Exim Bank is, is, has so much there that we just allow to lie redundant. When it comes to natural resources, we are not just blessed with the land, fertile land for that matter. We are blessed with water bodies, springs, grass that can feed any form of livestock, water, uh, rainfall pattern that can actually help any form of plant, su support the growth of any form of plant. And global access to global markets with AFTA and uh, new policies, Africa trade, the, the AFTA initiative, you can sell your produce anywhere in the West African sub-region. And currently, Agric has gone beyond manual work. You can actually monitor your farm would come to that very soon in your room, in the comfort of your room. You can take your phone and actually uh, um, water your plants. You can be in your uh, consulting room and actually uh, spray pe pesticides, monitor what is going on. There's so much has gone on over the years, which makes it very compelling for us to make agriculture an option for our investments. And currently, agriculture is no longer a very dirty job. If you you will come to realize in the subsequent presentations that if you take something like greenhouses, it's a very neat job. You can wear your nice uh, attire and then go to work. No debt at all. So when we talk about the agricultural va value chain, we are looking at the entire process of producing agricultural products, processing them, marketing them, and distributing them. Basically, we are looking at farm to plate, from the farm gates to the table. Think about it. This is so huge. Everybody has something to offer. There is no competition at all. You Agriculture is not a kind of profession or a kind of investment you say that I'm competing with someone. It's so vast with so many areas that have been untouched. So if you break down the value chain, which we'll do in shortly, we talk about the product, when we talk about production stage, we are talking about crop production, livestock farming, or aquaculture, where we grow fish. Processing stage, we want to add value to the raw agricultural products. In cocoa, you can process cocoa into nips, into butter, into cake. That is a processing point. For rice, after harvesting the raw rice product, you can mill it. And then for fruits, you can process it into fruit juice. Vegetables can be processed into powder, into oil. And for meat, we have various forms, sausage, uh, uh, meat, minced meat, and other forms, so many other forms that you can think of. Then there is also an opportunity in marketing. For example, you don't want to farm. You don't want to, you think farming is dirty. It's not actually dirty, but you don't want to farm. You can tap into the marketing aspect of farming and there's so much money to make there. There are even exporters. You can export. You, you, you don't need to farm. You can actually set up aggregate centers and just do ex exportation. Gather people, put people together to farm and you do the exporting and there's so much money there transports transporting food crops or livestock from the farm gate to the centers where they are market centers urban centers just the transportation primary transport secondary transport so much to make there then so let's take every stage step by step and see what opportunities you can have there for production in crop farming, you can grow a variety of crops like cocoa, maize, rice, and we are talking about the raw products. In livestock farming, we are looking at poultry, cattle, sheep, etc. For aquaculture, we are looking at tilapia, catfish, shrimps, etc. All this you can grow in Ghana. So let's look at some of the crops that are of high value right here in Ghana. Cash crops. Cocoa, cash crops are grown purely for export, for sale. Yeah, not for consumption. Yes, you can uh, take one or two 
uh, cocoa seeds. And, but cash crops are for exports, purely for the cash. Cocoa, coffee, coffee grows very well in Ghana. Cocoa grows very well. We have Robusta coffee growing in just virtually anywhere in Ghana. You can have Robusta coffee. Cashew nuts, high import value. It's in high demand in India and the rest of the world. Oil palm, rubber. Rubber, if you go to the Western region, rubber for both domestic consumption and for export, there is high demand. You can just decide to grow rubber plantations and then the returns are wonderful. Share nuts, coconuts, coconut, the case of coconuts, one of the biggest and most profitable businesses you can have in crop production. When you're looking at grains, Russia-Ukraine war brought a lot of pressure on our grain uh, imports. Domestic consumption of grains is huge. We spend so much money importing rice, maize, and all. So in Ghana here, maize grows very well. Just three-month cycle, you are harvesting maize. Rice grows very well here. Sogum, millet. Millet, sogum for the uh, breweries and um, uh, alcoholic beverage industries. There is so much demand. There, there, there's been a shortage of sorghum and millet for some time yet we've not uh, found it prudent to expand our production of sorghum and millet wheat there are some limited areas in ghana where you can grow wheat then you can look at tubers and roots cassava cassava domestically we consume cassava locally a lot cassava has a huge place in the uh, beverage industry as well, especially for alcohol. We have cassava beer in the production of alcohol, specifically um, uh, cassava preco and the rest have all, all used cassava, have extracted ethanol from cassava that is produced locally. Starch can be gotten from cassava. There's huge market for starch. And then even for feed production, cassava is right there. Sweet potatoes for food, locally, local consumption and for exports. The market is enormous. Yams for, for medicinal purposes. You know, a lot of the fillers we use in drug production are from yam. The milk powders we use, uh, all the baby foods and the rest are all processed yam powder. Local consumption. Yam is one of the biggest exports from Ghana, non-traditional exports from Ghana very 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 profitable crop if you want to go into it irish potatoes grow well in ghana as well you can go into their productions when it comes to legumes like soybean soybeans cow peas granuts bambara nuts they all grow very well everywhere in ghana fruits pineapple one of our biggest exports is pineapple mangoes huge huge opportunities in mango if you go to the eastern region especially uh, Somania area, huge mango plantations. Citrus fruits, oranges, lemons for fruit juice, for exports as concentrates or for local consumption. Bananas and plantains go to uh, Nsawam, huge banana plantations. Then it goes on. Vegetables, tomatoes, the returns you cannot imagine. Bell peppers will go into all this one by one, but these are the things that you can grow in Ghana. There is no shortage. There is so much that there is no competition. If we take 1,000 GMA members and everyone can take one, one, one crop or one livestock or one type of fish and you still have demands, then we don't only end, we not only end there, end there, we have ginger, herbs and spices our spices are in high demand all over the world in in india in the mediterranean space our herbs and spices even in north america all these are exports exportable products then talking about medicinal plants moringa neem lemongrass aloe vera lavender look it's just endless then we have special plants some of which are found just in Ghana. For example, we have griffonia, which is used to produce drugs that contain, uh, that maintain serotonin levels in the brain. Wakanga, 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 ex, its market in Ghana is about $25 million. 
it grows very well in the wild in Ghana. And sometimes you just have to go and, and harvest them for export. It contains locally, people have been using Wakanga here in Ghana for people who go mad. Excuse me, the people who have mental, sorry, challenges, mental challenges. They, use, they give them Wakanga leaves and then it improves. But basically, it contains um, Evnocetin, which, which can be used to treat Alzheimer's or improves memory. When it comes to sweetness, there are four natural sweetness in the world, and three of them grow in the world in Ghana with huge market potentials. Miracle berries are common. Miracle berries, in every we call them, when you take miracle berries, anything, even if it's the, the most bitter medicine you take, lemon, lime, any bitter thing will taste sweet. One kilogram of miracle berry powder is about $500. And you can produce tons, tons and tons of miracle berries for exports. Then we also have the combo butter, which grows very well in the wild in Ghana. As they, they call it pamprana oil here. And it's, it's, it contains products that are very good for joint pains and gout. There is a huge market for export. Look, when you just have to go to Ghana Export Promotion Authority and the market is there. They are looking for people. People just want to buy these products and nobody is growing them. Nobody is farming them. And you just can't understand why. Even in the horse industry, the horses work a lot for racing and the rest. And this combo butter is added to the horse feed to improve their joint function. Combo butter is found here in Ghana. Sobolo, the famous Sobolo, Sobolo has a huge export value. In Ghana, we do not grow hibiscus in commercial quantities. If you go to Senegal, huge hibiscus farms that uh, are harvested and exported to Canada, huge markets in North America. We are not doing enough in that regard. Then, of course, we have tea, specialty tea, which can grow in some limited areas in Ghana. Coffee, which can grow. I mean, when you go to um, Bibieni and the rest, there are some coffee plantations there. And then um, forestry and timber, tick. Tick that we use for electric poles for exports to the sub-region. Tick grows very well. The turnover is so good. Rosewood, we know you can also go into forestry and timber plantations purposely for exports. Then when it comes to livestock, you can grow sheep for meat and <laughs> you'll be amazed. It will come to all this. You can grow sheep for meat. So mostly in Ghana here, goats for the meat as well. In Ghana, there's goat milk, which, which also has export potential, especially for goat cheese and the rest. Then we have pigs. We have the swine, which is purely for meat production, for its meat, and we have the crossbreeds. Which, which are very res resistant to diseases. Poultry, of course, we have the uh, broiler chickens for food layers and all. We have cattle for the beef and even the milk market, local consumption of milk, the wagashis, the local yogurts producing, uh, uh, the, the yogurts market and all. Cattle for milk, huge potential both locally and then outside for fish there is a huge demand for the flesh of uh, uh, the tilapia they grow very fast they are very adaptable the, in fact there is so much demand that we have we actually have to import tilapia from china to to meet demands and with our huge water bodies like the volta lake volta river where you can actually do cage farming you just drop the cage in the water and then grow your fish. I don't know why we are not taking advantage of it. Then uh, another fish species that grow very well here is the catfish. And then we have the Nile perch. And then um, the crushing species, which are small fishes you can grow in a, a, as part of integrated farming. For processing, when we talk about processing, we talk we are talking about adding value to our agricultural produce. And cocoa, we can have artisanal chocolate processing. We are not saying 
process set up processing factories. I know we may not have enough funds to do very huge ones, but you can set up artisanal chocolate factories, uh, chocolate processing. We have some doctors who are already into that. We have one in the Eastern region who is into um, some local cocoa processing. Then of course you can go into meat processing it for sausage, which is in high demand in most of our uh, hotels and restaurants. Then when you come, when you move from processing, warehousing and storage facilities, most of our villages don't, where the, the food products are produced, don't even have any warehousing facilities. So it doesn't cost so much to actually build warehouses. So why don't we go down to the villages instead of building hotels and apartments, build warehouses where we can store food grains, uh, food and then crops when they are in high, uh, when when they are in season with high production for the lean season. Transportation, transporting cocoa from the farm to the depots alone. You don't need an articulator truck. You just need a Kia truck, not necessarily a brand new Kia truck to do primary evacuation of farm produce. I mean, if you, even if you want to stretch it, just using a bubble air to move cocoa from the farm to to the depots, not even the depots, the the, the sheds where they, they they buy the cocoa. That alone is an investment opportunity. And if you want to stretch it, then you are talking about articulator tracks that can move cocoa from the hinterlands to the ports. So there are various levels of transportation, the primary, secondary, and tertiary ones we can all invest in. So when you talk about warehousing, you can build modern warehouses. Proper, there is always a need for warehouses. All the cocoa, most of the cocoa companies don't even have warehousing facilities in their districts. Cocoa is found over, over 70 districts in Ghana, and most of them do not have warehouses. Just so you have an idea about the opportunity in warehousing, when it comes to cash crops like cocoa, cashew, um, uh, and all, you would have to keep them at the district level. No, not even at the district level, at the local community level before it's evacuated to the district level, before evacuation to the ports for exports. Warehousing facilities can be built in all these places and then you earn good money for it. Then there is a cold storage facilities. There is high post harvest losses for our products. A lot of oranges go waste. A lot of our vegetables go waste. If a lot of the a lot of people produce fish, that during the peak harvesting season go die because there are no cold store facilities. When you go to the Volta along the Volta River, the Volta River, Kwando, Kweje, and the rest, where people do a lot of a cage farming within the water during harvest peak harvest season there is nowhere to store the fishes and a lot of them end up dying then you can also have dry storage facilities these grains and cereals can last even sometimes over a year and if you have proper management of your storage facilities there is so much money to make there so in the same vein bulk storage silo storage sometimes you don't even need to build them you just have mobile storage solutions where there are mobile mobile silos you can move them to store grain in one area and then uh, when there is a need in another area you move them they are not permanent structures they are mobile sometimes with cooling systems where uh, you can transport from the villages to the cities then there's something called warehouse receipt systems which offers a very good financial finance and market opportunity to us doctors. You know, you can actually have a warehouse where people store things in exchange of receipts. And those receipts can, they don't, they don't need to move the produce to urban centers or uh, where they are needed to sell. You can just hold these receipts and those receipts serve as money for you. They serve as evidence that you have produced somewhere. And you, the person keeping the, the, the produce in the warehouse, 
you can actually put some interest on, on top of it, especially when they use this warehouse receipt systems to access loans and inputs for their farms. Then, then we have transport and logistics services, which we have already talked about. We have last mile distribution uh, services. That is in the area of um, inputs, input sales, where you, you sell pesticides and fertilizers and all to the, the, the farmers in the villages. You just have to develop a system where you can sell these things, which are almost always in high demand in, in these villages. I, I don't know how to really let you understand that there's so much money to make in these uh, value chain businesses. Then there's cold chain logistics. In Ghana, a lot of people don't invest in cold chains. Even transporting, cold chain transport is not a refrigerated transport. We don't have a lot of them where you can transport vegetables from the farm gates to the urban centers at a fee. And then you can also have what we call uh, specialty stores. That is at a retail level. So you can set up farmer's markets. For example, you can just set up farmer's markets in, let's say, Confanoche, where you are the doctor. You're not even farming. All you do is make sure that you source fresh vegetables, very fresh ones, and then in your small farmer's market somewhere or your specialty store just at Confanoche. Basically, everybody wants... Everybody is health conscious. Everybody wants healthy, fresh fruits. And just that small market, you'll be amazed the number of people who would buy for you. And, and then you can actually also set up online retail platforms. So all you have to do is develop a small app and uh, you are at the hospital, develop, uh, develop a small app and people can actually buy, order their vegetables and fruits and everything farm produce from you. Now, there are other opportunities like branding and packaging. Some people, for example, you can have your yam and just convert your yam to yam chips and brand it very well and sell sweet potatoes. So many, you can do your Tom Browns and everything. Those are all opportunities in the agric value chain. Sometimes you just pick up the fruits, the vegetables and everything from the villages repackage them to meet international standards and then uh, onward for onward exports. Now, there's something that is really happening in the agricultural sector lately. That is technology and innovation in agriculture. There is an opportunity to invest there. For example, you can develop mobile apps to help farmers to actually assess finance. So mobile apps that will give farmers weather forecast. And when I talk, when we are talking about farmers, there are groups of farmers. We have the the peasant farmers who would not necessarily use your apps, but we have people who are into look. Just travel around Ghana, go to Dawenya, go to the eastern region, and the kind of people who are into farming and the technologies they require. There is so much market there. Then we have Internet of Internet of Things sensors. These are these are small sensors that we deploy to monitor your your farm for soil 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 moisture, temperature, humidity, crop health, all in heal, real time. The truth is, with these technologies, you can have your farm somewhere, sit in your room, and actually deploy them to do this monitoring for you. We have end of season data analytics, which uses machine learning to actually, and then predictive analytics to actually predict how much yield you have. They, they are not abstract things. These are happening. When you go to Kweu, there is someone doing Pepe Day. These guys use all these technologies. It's, they, they are simple technologies using drones. They, they are not complex. They just take drones and then attach the sensors to it fly the drones wherever they want to go using GPS systems. And these drones can pick up a lot of uh, heat maps to know whether your crops are doing well, 
to know whether the humidity is right and all. And talking about drones, a lot of these drones are equipped with uh, camera sensors, imaging technologies, and they monitor crop health. They can assess the field conditions of your farm. And you don't need to walk through the whole farm. You just park somewhere, and these drones will give you all the pictures, will give you all the uh, weather conditions, and whether some of the crops are dying or not. They can even map your soil and tell you where you would have a very good yield and where you have very bad yield. So these days, the farming is not, it's, it's, it's not a, a fiscal work. You don't have to walk through your farms. A lot of these things are handy. They come in handy. They are cheap. They are very cheap technologies. And then when it comes to financing, we are talking about access to finance. How do you get access to finance? How do you create financing opportunities? You can have your own microfinance where you give out inputs to farmers at a cost or in form of loans and they pay back with produce. So if you have cocoa farmers somewhere, you set up your own microfinance system where farmers will come for fertilizers, will come for, um, will come for fertilizers, will come for uh, uh, pesticides, weedicides, and then during the season when they harvest, they pay back with produce, with interests on this produce, and you have no idea how much you can make. Then, of course, you have to take you can take advantage of a lot of government subsidies, grants, and loans in the system. And in Ghana, for example, the ADB and Ghana Infrastructure Investment Funds provide loans for farmers, the, uh, the microfinancial institutions like Opportunity International, Sinapi, Aba, Savings and Loan provide agribusiness tillage loans, which you can assess, not huge loans. And when I, these are special interest rate loans, you are not going to uh, take these loans at 30% or 20% and all. You will come to, uh, for example, Exit Bank, where you are looking at 2 to 5% interest rate over a period of four to five years. And they will not only give you the loan, they actually help you to establish the farm. In fact, in, in some of the models from Exim Bank, you have the land, they give, they, they bring all the electricity, the water, the road and everything to the farm, supports the growth of the farm and the interest rates is still as low as 2 to 5%. It used to be 2%. I think it's currently around 5%. And you can, you should be able to pay this back with a kind of yield very soon. We'll see how much you make from an acre of some of the common produce we have. And you'll be amazed. Then, of course, there are several grants available for your farming. Just start. You can assess grants from international organizations. All you have to do is that just start. And you see that the government of Ghana input subsidies. For example, there are free fertilizers. They may not be free. Even if, if it's not free, it's highly subsidized for cocoa and for some of the cash crops. Then you have um, loan schemes like the agricultural credit facility, which is highly subsidized from Bank of Ghana for you to be able to um, grow your food. And those are available to the youth, women, and other agricultural cooperatives, which you can easily join and assess these funds. Then of course, there is high impact uh, capacity building programs where probably, for example, planting food for youth, for jobs, youth in agroforestry, they are there, they will, they will provide you the training extension services, which you don't need to pay for some of the time. And of course there is, there are other opportunities at the private sector where you can get money to do your funding, uh, your farming. For example, we have the um, Ghana Venture Capital Trust Fund where they invest in your farm for equity. So you give them 30% of your farm and then they give you money in return to grow the farm. Some of this venture capital supports your uh, uh, startup and agricultural enterprises. Then we also have the Invest in Africa and then uh, Moringa Connect and other types of impact investment funds. For them, these are more like grants. They give you the money because probably you are supporting some women group or some widows 
you've employed widows on your farm. You've employed the disabled to do some, uh, to take care of certain aspects of your farm. When you do these things, you are actually impacting socially. You're actually doing something which is environmentally friendly and you have access to these grants which don't attract any loan, any interest. So you'll be able to expand your farm and make the necessary profits you need to do. Okay, so having looked at all the opportunities, the most important question is, how do you start your farm? What are the important steps when you want to actually go into farming? I think probably this is the most important part to a lot of people. And I've seen a lot of people fail in farming because they do not take time to go through these processes. If you have any intention of going into farming, then I think this is the most important part for you to um, actually listen to. So a lot of people go and get land and then they just hear farming is profitable. So I want to start farming and then boom, all their money is lost. A lot of, I've had so many people go like, oh, farming, the, the farm hands will spend all your money and then they'll keep, they keep telling you stories. So many people have repeated those mistakes. So many colleagues have made such mistakes and I have several stories of, of that. But let's look at it. Why do people fail? What are the things they, they did not do right that ended in uh, that failure? And anytime you fail in farming, you've lost so much money. First, you can see I, repeat, I repeated market research three times. If you want to farm, you first have to do your market research. Personally, if I don't have an off taker, if I don't have a buyer for my produce ready, I have no business going into that farming. If everybody says cocoa is, cocoa is um, profitable and I don't have a clear cut path to how I'll market my cocoa produce, how I'll sell my produce, I don't have any business going into cocoa. You'll hear somebody saying that pepper is profitable and then you just go and farm pepper. It will rot on your farm. So first, do your market research. Research, research, research. Do your market research very well. Get, in fact, sometimes your market research can actually get you a buyer. And you sign the contracts with the buyer. And that contract you have signed even serves as a collateral for you to go and assess money from the bank. And when I mean from the bank, agricultural loans are not 20%. If you, if you go and borrow money at even 10% to farm I mean, that is wrong. That is not right. You are going to work 10%. That is still, it's too high. If you need money to farm, you should be looking at 2 to 5%. You should be looking at grants. Those are the things. If you, are, if you can't raise your own money, the kind of interest you need, interest rates you need should be not more than 5% or maybe 7% at most. And that is where the research is. You have to research to know where you can get such funds where you can get the grants if you want to go into um if you want to use grant money for the farming then you have to do this you have to research and get your market first sometimes sign a contract somebody is willing to take 500 bags of maize from you then you use this contract to go and raise money to actually uh, uh, start your farm or expand your farm some some brewery comp brewery needs uh, 200 bags of sorghum and then you sign the contract and you go into production there are people who have processing factories they are processing uh, for example some people process maize into grits for exports or for the local breweries some people there are some companies uh, alcoholic beverage companies like a super code that needs starch you go to them, you have a small farm, one acre. You tell them you would be able to produce this quantity, get the contract, use the contract to raise the finance, the necessary grants and, and money, go to your land and then farm. Immediately you farm, there is ready market for it. So you will not run at a loss. If you want market, even for export, go to Ghana Export Promotion Authority. When you go to their office in Accra, they have a very nice cafe, computers. Look, everything you need, all the market statistics, data, people who are looking to buy produce from Ghana, everything is in there. The staff would assist you. It's, it's, it's such a luxurious space that nobody is using. Just go, FDA is there. They will assist you with all the documentation. Um, 
a Ghana Revenue Authority is there, whatever you need to be able to meet the exports and the, the exports criteria, they will help you with it. Just go get your market and then get to the field. Then the second step, after you have researched and you know that you are, you are confident, you are very much certain that you want to go into ginger farming, then you must choose your location. And when you are choosing your location, location is so important because even though we keep saying that oh, all kinds of crops can grow anywhere in Ghana, all kinds of um, animals can grow anywhere in Ghana. If you go and farm, for example, recently somebody was farming in Brekum. After three, five years, he had so much goats. Yeah, so yes, he had a, a huge goat farm. And then all of a sudden, the traditional authorities said, um, it's a taboo to grow or to farm goats in, in Brekum. And he had to move his goats. Probably he didn't do the due diligence to know the location to site his goat farm. There are some parts of the country, for example, if you want to grow pepper, uh, habanero pepper, for example. In some parts of the country, it is seasonal because they will have, because of the rainfall pattern. But in other parts of the country, for example, when you go to areas like Esichari, um, some places along the the river, the Volta River, Pon Esichari area, there's so there is always water, and growing pepper in those places is not seasonal, so location really matters. And soil pH, if you are going into crop farming. Soil pH plays an extremely important role in what kind of crop can grow. So you have to make sure that you choose a location with a good soil condi condition for the plant you want to actually grow. Then you have to also look at access to water resources, where you want to grow your plants. Is there some river flowing around you can use for irrigation? Would you be able to sink mechanized boreholes to use for irrigation? And nobody depends on rainfall for farming lately. Rainfall is a bonus. If you want to go into farming and you are studying rainfall patterns as your main determinant of what you would uh, grow, forget it. You don't want to farm. Now, nobody, we, nobody grows crops using rainfall patterns. It's a bonus. If it rains, fine. If it doesn't rain, fair. Currently, you, you, what you need is access to water and all. Look at all those things before you choose your location. Then market proximity, extremely important. You want to grow pepper for export, for example. In fact, not, not, um, not even pepper. Let me say you want to grow. By the way, people grow flowers, horticulture, rose flowers, lavender for exports, fresh rose for export. You want to grow fresh rose for ex export. The plain leaves, I think the plain leaves um, probably around 10 a.m. to South Africa and then to where you are exporting your produce to. There is no international flight from Kumasi to your export market and you decide to site your rose plants or rose farm or your lavender farm in Kumasi. I mean, that is completely wrong. You need access to the market so that if you are targeting exports, you should be where there is some international airport. You harvest straight away, you fly to your destination. Then you should look at access to road, electricity, storage facilities, and all that before you site your farm. Second, then another important thing about location is the land tenure and the regulatory environment in the area. Some places land is owned by families. Some other places land is owned by individuals. Are you buying the land outright, the farm land outright, or you are leasing? Some places you start a farm and then development will meet your farm and they tell you it's no longer for you because you bought it as a farmland. Now development meet, meet, meets your farm. So you have to relinquish the land to them. It happens all the time here in Kumasi. So location is so important. Choose your location right, and then you will make the profits you're supposed to make.
then you these days you can't farm with your medical knowledge. It won't work. You have to engage experts. And engaging experts does not mean that you are going to engage some farm hand who had stayed on a cocoa farm for 20 years or some farm hand who has stayed on a rice farm for 30 years. He's perfected his mistakes and you repeat the same mistakes that would actually destroy your farm. When we talk about experts, we are talking about agronomists. If you can't engage an agronomist, don't start a crop farm. Just forget it. If you won't pay an agronomist to do your soil testing, to do your uh, 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 land management and everything for you, forget it. Don't even start. Don't go and employ somebody who said he done, he's done pepper for 30 years and he's an expert. Please, we've passed that stage long ago. So you should look at the experience and expertise of the person. Does he have the necessary qualifications? Has he practiced? Then your experts, you should also look at the network and relationships of your experts. Does he have network? For example, if you engage an expert who is highly networked and meets a problem, he will just, you. it's just like how we practice medicine. If I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I'm very networked, I have gynecologist friends, I have a nephrologist friends. When I meet, when I have any problem during my consultation, which requires a, a urologist intervention, because of a very good network, the very good network I have, I should be able to easily call in the urologist to help so that I'll continue my gynecologic management. So get an expert who is networked, networked in terms of his expertise and also market, market and experts who knows the market very well and can contact friends for export, who is knowledgeable, who knows where to sell your produce when you are stuck. And then you should always have customized solutions, customized solutions. It shouldn't be what everybody else is doing. If somebody is doing drip irrigation in a situary, does not mean that drip irrigation is what is going to work for you. Or let's say somebody is using mist blower system somewhere. It does not mean that the mist blower system that should work for you. So look at your farm. Let your experts give you customized solutions. Then it is also important to have a farm manager. Please have a farm manager. This farm manager should be somebody who can communicate to you very well. Because at the end of the day, you, you are not an absentee farmer, but you are not a full-time farmer. You are a doctor. You can't be on the farm every day. Employ a full-time farm manager who has the necessary qualifications. The experts is different for the farm manager. The experts are the people who come and take care of your plants, like the agronomist, like the veterinary officer who comes in when, you're, uh, when your animals are sick to inject them, disinfect them, and all. Then... You have the farm manager who is on the farm, who is managing your farm, who is taking care of all your farm hands. And this farm manager should also have financial literacy, should have some business acumen. You should know that the farm is business and should be very much interested in how much you make out of your farm. farm. The next important step is to have a monitoring system. As I said, a monitoring system the, the manual way of monitoring your farm, unless it's a small-scale farm, maybe. So that's another thing that happens. People go and buy 30-acre cocoa farms, and they are so lazy to probably walk the length and breadth of the farm. They set up 20-acre pepper farms, and they can't walk through the 20 acres. You don't need to walk through your farm. Whatever monitoring system you have, you have data collection analysis capabilities. These days, we have automated farming. There, there are sensors, there are drones, there are I the, we have the EOSDA, we have the I, IoT monitoring systems, which you can deploy. They pick up the, the, the sense, the temperature. So, for example, you have a pepper farm. This automated technology can sense that no. The temperature is too high at this moment and would actually tell you how much water you should, uh, uh, would tell you to engage the irrigation system and then know how much water you should give the plants for how many minutes. It's all automated. Machine learning 
has made sure AI and all has made sure that all these tools are highly automated with very little human input. Once it's set and your agronomist determines all the parameters, these things pick up the signals and then alert you. You can fly your drone, you can monitor your farm from your phone. In fact, whatever you use for monitoring, make sure that it is reliable. You can scale it if you want to increase your farm size. So as much as possible, make sure you rely on a monitoring system, which is not yourself. And when I mean yourself, I'm talking about physical involvement. You don't need to walk through the whole farm. If you have the time and energy to do it, perfect. Then security. Security is so important. Other than that, you plant for the community. People will steal all your produce. Invest in security. Get security people to guard your farms for you. You can use CCTV cameras. You can use drones to monitor your farm. In fact, security is not just against humans. It's also against animals. In an extreme example, uh, uh, some other one, one company used, they grew pythons, snakes. They, they actually had a snake farm and they used snakes advantage points on the farm uh, to guard the farm. So when the people, the, the thieves and the rest go near the farm and they see the pythons and all, then they stopped worrying the, the, the farm. So in, invest in security. Then finally, ensure your farm. Farming, as much, in as much as a lot of the things look very rosy, there can be natural disasters, there can be diseases. COVID came and the world changed. In the animal world, in the plant world, there are diseases as well. You can have your poultry farm doing so well, and then one minute, the whole farm is gone. All the birds are dead. You should insure your farm. And the, the, a perfect one you can use is the Ghana Agri Insurance which is a German government-sponsored insurance system for farms. You insure your farms, anything happens, at least you recoup some of the losses, if not all the losses you made during the uh, first month, the, the unfortunate incidents. So let's look at, for example, some of the fruits, some of the cash crops we can plant. Coconuts. Coconut plantations are hugely profitable because they are... They are very resistant to pests. Coconut grows very well, very resistant to pests. And every part of your coconuts, from the plants to everything, the fruit, everything can be processed. There is practically zero waste when it comes to your coconuts. Aside that there is high demand for coconut products, you may not know because you see coconuts all over the place, Ghana two-thirds of our coconut farms plantations are all dead with two-thirds. So there is shortage of coconuts even in country. The reason is a lot of people planted the dwarf coconuts, which has a lifespan of just 20 years. Instead of going for the hybrid plants, the Vanuatu breeds, which last for 80 years, keep producing fruits for 80 years and are high yielding too. So coconut itself is in high demand. Nigeria, dry coconut, there's a huge market in Nigeria. We export a lot to Nigeria. Spain, North America, they are off the case of our coconut products. Then the coconut water itself, locally, you'll be amazed at how, how profitable it is. Some people don't even have coconut farms. All they do is to go and buy the, pro, the coconut fruits from the farm and then sell to those who sell it to us on the streets, even that can make you at least 4,500 every week. Just picking it from the farm, not your farm, somebody's farm, and selling it to the street vendor can make you 4,500 every week. Then, um, as we said, you can process the coconut into various forms, virtually zero wastage. So the hybrid ones will last for 80 years. They keep fruiting for almost 80 years. The dwarf ones are more ornamental. It, they are convenient because one and a half years, they start fruiting, they are short, but that is not for commercial purposes. And they will last for probably, they will, 
the lifespan for fruiting is about 20 years. The hybrid ones will fruit probably after two, two to three years, whilst the dwarfs will fruit after one and a half years. On the average, you'd have about 20 fruits per tree and you can do about 80 trees per acre. We'll go into the mathematics and you see, with the processing fresh fruit coconut juice, dry coconuts, which from which you can extract coconut oil, either cold press or hot press, you can actually export the, the, the coconut oil or the, the dry coconut fruit as well. Then there is coconut biscuit, there's coconut chips, which is all over the market, coconut ginger that we've been buying for our cold, coconut tom brown, coconut bread, then coconut milk, which is served in the hotels. You can actually go into coconut ecotourism where you have your plantation and you have your coconut uh, hotel on it. So if you are setting up a coconut farm, you have to prepare the land. Let's take this like a, a one acre, setting up a one acre coconut farm. The plowing and harrowing will cost you about $300. The land clearing, I'd not add cost for agronomist, farm manager, and farm hands because it's just one acre. And that is small. Yes, you can bring in an agronomist and, and butter trade. One acre is, is small. You can butter trade. You are a doctor. They, they consult you. You can bring him in to also take care of your small coconut farm for you. Plowing and harrow will cost you about $300. The land clearing, about $500. Uh, the soil testing, fencing, and then coconut, the seedlings is about $2 per seedling. So you need about 200 seedlings for your one acre. And uh, planting labor, weeding labor, uh, the weeding labor, you cost that as well. Harvesting labor, those who would harvest the fruits for you. Irrigation, if you won't irrigate, you can't do any planting Please don't go into any farming at all if you want to depend on rainfall. Irrigation is the way to go. If you don't have any irrigation facility on your farm, go and stop that farm immediately and, and install an irrigation facility. If you have a water body close by, yes, you can, you can just do your drip irrigation. If you don't, sink your own mechanized boreholes and then let the experts do the drip irrigation system for you. It's not very expensive. It's only these days that the pipe pipelines, you can actually order spec you can actually order pipes that are thinner and they'll make those for you. They are cheaper, not too expensive. And considering that you can have an all year round yield, the advantages are so enormous. Don't go into any crop farming without an irrigation system. So installation of drip irrigation would always come in any cost factor when you are budgeting for your farm. Budget for fertilizers, especially organic fertilizers. If you say organic fertilizers, it does not mean it should necessarily be manure. It just means that whatever you are using should come from natural sources. That's all. Then your pesticides and fungicides. Coconut is very resistant to uh, pests and then uh, this inf infections. So you don't spend so much on that. Even though there is still, you still have to spend on that. You, you budget for marketing and then your packaging. So in all, you may probably need about $5,000 to set up a one acre coconut farm. That one acre coconut farm in the first year, you make losses because if you calculate, you may get about 200 nuts per tree. If you have 50 trees, which is modest, then we are looking at um, making around $3,750 uh, for your, uh, um, from your plants. But for cash crops, the disadvantage is you always make losses the first two years because most, you have, you not really have the plants fruiting at maximum capacity. So the, the negative profit is due to the establishment costs but as the years go by, the profitability improves. And annually, you can, the projections, you can earn on the average 1 million, you can as high as 1 million Ghana CD 
per um, acre of coconut farm per year if you take advantage and maximize all your uh, 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 production value chain. Then ginger. There is an increasing global demand for ginger, especially ginger powder in cooking, for medicinal purposes, for the cosmetic industry, export. Everything, every food we eat here, we have ginger in it. And ginger is also very resilient to pests. Most of the varieties grow well in Ghana here. The, the yield is very high and it's a very profitable crop for smallholder and commercial farmers. Some of the things you can get from ginger, ginger powder, you can process it into the ginger oil. And then even the beverage industry, every drink, sobole and ginger, uh, pineapple ginger, passion fruit ginger. There is so much you can do with ginger. And government also supports ginger farming a lot. For ginger farming, $200 for plowing and harrowing, $300 for clearing. That's an acre. You are setting up an acre of ginger farm. When you go through the motions, at the end of the day, your annual returns could be as high as $20,000 for a ginger farm per acre, one acre of ginger farm annually. Then finally, let's look at greenhouse technology. Greenhouse technology is the new age. That is the gold mine. We call it the green gold, the urban gold, urban green. This is bringing farming to the cities. You don't need to be in your village or your, you don't need to go far. You can do your greenhouse farming at the center of the city, right in the middle of the city. And the potential, the earnings are enormous, especially now that Kumasi is going to have an international airport. For those of you in Kumasi, I'm in Kumasi, that's what I'm talking about Kumasi. You should start thinking about greenhouse farming because the potentials for exports is so huge that the demand can never be met. Even locally in Kumasi, we have the greenhouse farm at KNUST, Mango Road. When they harvest by 8.30, just the KNUST community consumes everything. If you go there by 10, you may not even get the, some of the vegetables to buy. So even local consumption, everybody wants fresh vegetables. Everybody wants vegetables that are free from pests and diseases they want it fresh and fleshy and clean so there is no other form of farming that gives you these features other than greenhouse the greenhouse technology normally greenhouse increases productivity profitability and sustainability because the climate everything you need for farming is controlled at optimum in your greenhouse so there is, uh, there is a crop protection and climate control. The environment temperature is controlled. Humidity is controlled. Ventilation is controlled. You protect the whole farm from adverse weather conditions. There is no access for insects. The whole environment is automated. So when you talk about vegetables and fruits, flowers, herbs, green farm, uh, uh, Greenhouse is the way to go. And you have an all year round cultivation of the crops. There is nothing like dry season. There is nothing like um, a, a rainy season. And you have maximum yield and quality. In fact, even water management is so efficient. The water is recycled. And the, green farm, the, the greenhouses don't use even soil. We use uh, the cocoa pits to plant these trees. And then they use hydroponic systems to water the plants. So it's just, it's, it's just amazing. When you go to, and it's, it's a technology that is transforming cities, transforming towns that are either to rocks, rocky cities or deserts to full food production communities. Almera in Spain used to be a rocky city. It used to be just rocks and deserts. Currently, Almera, Almera is producing over $25 billion uh, worth of vegetables for export throughout the whole of Europe. The interesting thing is they don't even have the, the, the environment backing them, the, the weather conditions backing them. We have it in Ghana. So if you 
if you go into greenhouse technology in Ghana, the chances of even yielding higher is very, very, very high. So let's look at some of the, this is a typical greenhouse growing some vegetable. Let's look at some of the advantages and, you, and the quality of the food is assured. You can grow any food in the uh, greenhouse system that you would that would be at the mercy of pests or diseases. No, no way. So, and then greenhouse systems also use precision automation and sensor-based monitoring systems. When you have your greenhouse farming, this is what we mean. You can go into your greenhouse, walk through the the size of the average greenhouse is less than 640 square meters. You can practically walk through the whole farm. That is one. Everything, the watering system is automated on your phone. You don't need farm hands. In fact, for each greenhouse, the maximum number of people you need to employ is one. You just need one person. If you don't have the time, you just need one person to manage it for you. If you have the time, you can manage it yourself. But you just need one person because everything is automated. There are sensors within the greenhouse that pick up a temperature, humidity. So if the weather is too hot, it will alert you that the weather is hot. By the click of a button on your phone, it will start watering the plants. If it's for six minutes, it will water it for six minutes. And you may be able, you may do that for four, up to four or five times a day, depending on the weather conditions. Everything is automated. So if you have a, a greenhouse, typical greenhouse, about $25,000 to set up. It's not cheap, but there is a way out. Using $25,000 to set up a greenhouse, that has a lifespan of 40 years. One greenhouse has a lifespan of 40 years. You'll be, you'll be earning from that greenhouse for 40 good years. Currently, a modest return, if you don't earn anything from your greenhouse, you earn at least about $10,000 per year from your greenhouse. The advantage of the greenhouse is that if you use a greenhouse system, there are already off tickets. You don't need to look for markets. Companies like Agri-Impact and the rest, the companies that even bring the greenhouse down, they, they have a buying arm. All you have to do is to set it up. They, can, they would even set it up for you and take management fee. If you want to employ your own person to be monitoring, it's fine. They can still employ somebody to monitor it for you. The, green, the greenhouse hubs we have in Ghana currently are sponsored, not sponsored, but have been held by Exim Bank to establish. So Exim Bank gets the area. When you go to Dawenya, there's a big one. I think that's the largest enclave we have in Ghana. The land was acquired several years ago by Kwame Nkrumah for purposes of that. And Exim Bank has developed the land, sent in electricity, water, road network, everything. And it's broad, vast with the greenhouses there. If you go into that enclave and acquire, let's say one greenhouse, everything you need to manage that greenhouse is there. And every produce from that greenhouse is already bought in advance. You, you, you don't need to, if you, you can decide to sell to them or you can decide to sell to your own uh, uh, market. You can decide your own market. $25,000 to $28,000 to set up. You can get a loan from Exim Bank at 2 to 5% four-year repayment plan. Within four years, you would have repaid your loan and the greenhouse is there for you to use for 36 years, earning you good money. Let's take a cumbers. By and and the, the harvesting time in greenhouses are so short. Within a month, within four weeks, your cucumbers are ready for harvest. And when it's ready for harvest, you can harvest every day for three to four months. Every day you go in and harvest and go. Every day you go in and harvest and go. And you can harvest up to three cycles per year. So if you do some local, some calculation, there is local market for cucumbers, the malls. The malls scattered all over Accra in the cities, the, the markets. They buy 
each kilogram of uh, cucumber at 15 to 18 CD per kilo. In a year, you can produce seven to eight tons of cucumber. That's about 8,000 kilos per cycle, not per, per cycle per year. So if you do three cycles, we are looking at 15 CD times 8,000 times three, that's about 360,000 easily earned from your greenhouse. Tomatoes. Tomatoes are worried by pests a lot. If you plant your tomatoes using the traditional methods, in any case, you can have your traditional tomato plant. All you need is your irrigation system, your agronomists, you need your uh, watering system, the irrigation system very tight, pest, pest control, because tomatoes normally worried by pests. Nematodes in the soil, you control them. And then if you plant very resistant and fleshy uh, varieties, you can earn so much. Abale is the most resistant variety. It's fleshy. Abale is flesher than what you, what you get from um, the ones imported from Burkina Faso. Abale is fruity, is heavy. It can stay on the shelf for more than three weeks without, you can't, without refrigeration. But here we grow, the tomatoes we grow is normally table tomatoes. We don't grow industrial tomatoes, the ones that are used for the paste. And the, the, what happens is the rainfall, the reason Ghana has a shortage of tomatoes always is the rainfall dependent tomatoes is only seasonal. It's seasonal, three to two to three months, it peaks. Then you don't find it on the market again. But if you use greenhouses, before then, just for perspective, we spend $100 million to import fresh tomatoes annually from Burkina Faso and Niger. In fact, Burkina Faso, 75,000 tons of tomatoes are imported into Ghana annually. Kumasi, about 21 trucks of tomatoes come to uh, uh, the Kumasi market every day, every blessed day, 21 trucks from Burkina to Kumasi to Accra about 24 trucks and then to Takradi about 20 trucks daily, every day, every blessed day. That should tell you the local market for tomatoes. Now, when you plant tomatoes in a greenhouse, fruiting starts just after five weeks. That's a little over a month. In two week, two months, that's about eight weeks, you can start harvesting. And when you talk about tomatoes, you can grow sherry tomatoes, you can grow abale and resistant varieties, fruity varieties, they are all there. And you can harvest continuously for four months. If you optimize conditions in your greenhouse. Um, good evening, Dr. Sorry, yeah. I have to interrupt you. The time is uh, limited. Yeah, yeah, so, so we are I'm almost do, done. Yeah, okay, so you can have about five kilos per plant. The only thing you have to know is in these greenhouses, pollination is done is it's done manually. So your farm hand pollinates it every every week, and then we have what we call the net house, which is bigger than a greenhouse, and it has a cooler inside and can actually function very well in the north. You can actually do chili pepper in the greenhouse in the net house and produce about 40,000 metric tons per hectare of uh, chili pepper. And that would amount to about 40,000 euros per year. And the market is huge. So if you need resources on where to get seed seedlings, you can go to Holland Green Tech. They have hybrid seedlings that are resistant. When you need market access, you need information on exports where you can sell your produce, people who are ready to buy, go to Ghana Export Promotion Authority. They have all those data there. Exim Bank can give you low interest loans. And if you need the technology, you need consultancies, you can go to Agri Impact. Um, greenhouses can serve as pensions for individuals. If you acquire a greenhouse with funding from, let's say, Exim Bank, they'll provide all the framework. You take a loan, $25,000 from them to set up your greenhouse. Everything is managed, pay in four years. If you take your loan, you are 40 years or 45 years and you take this loan, then in four years, when you are 45 to 50, you would have paid off 
the greenhouse will last for 40 years for you. And every month, every year, you're making $10,000 in the modest, the most modest returns, $10,000 annually. So for pensions, acquire it, pay off your loan, and then for the next 35 years in your pension, you are making $10,000 or more. Then uh, as a group, GMA can invest in multiple greenhouses or net houses and then have phenomenal returns for our people. Then we can also invest in large-scale plantations in resilient cash crops like coconut tick plantations and also in eco-tourism like setting up farm-to-plate eco-villages where you can just go rest uh, hunt your own fish, uh, hunt, hunt your own goats, prepare your, your meat and everything there, um, kill your own fish, everything. And then uh, uh, all on your farm, have that farm experience. We have, of course, we have infrastructure constraints like roads, electricity and water, which you have to deal with. We have access to finance, high interest rates. If you don't know the right place to go for loans and then price changes. The market can break down at any point. In conclusion, there is a vast investment opportunity within, the, within Ghana's agricultural value chain, from crop cultivation to livestock farming to agro-processing and export markets. I urge you all to explore innovative solutions, strategic partnerships, and then take advantage of government support initiatives to unlock the full economic potential of agriculture in Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Medfred, for such a wonderful and elaborate presentation. So there are some questions in the Q&A session, which I would like to read them out to you. Uh, Dr. Med Eric Wilson is asking that if you could kindly uh, walk him through the process of exporting crops, the non-traditional ones, and Dr. Wilson Adam Saba is asking, how is he it is to access land for farming and if there are fun funding available to get the farmlands. And uh, Dr. Selassie, Dr. Dent Selassie Temaklu is asking, regarding the interest on loans for farming, what are the rates per annum? And Dr. Robert Jude McCoy Odo is asking, on setting up a private practice. This question goes to Dr. Apadi. Can you please throw more light on the various uh, government institutions that, will have, that you will have to register and also taxes you have, you have to pay? And if record losses in the first few years of your practice, and if you record losses in the first few years of your practice, will you still have to pay taxes? Can the panelists please help us answer these questions? Thank you. So let's start with Dr. Dr. Medfred, the questions which were directed to you. Thank you. Um, how easy is it to assess land for farming? It's just so easy. Farmlands don't cost, they don't cost so much. Um, farmlands are so cheap. When you go to Ghana, when you go to Wenchi or Finso, Kumbewu, an acre of farmland can sell as little as 3,500 CD. Not a plot of land, an acre, which is about uh, four plots, will sell about 3,005 to 5,000 Ghana CD. And all over, all around Kumasi, down the, the when you go to the district assemblies and you go to the Greek, they have that Greek office as part of the district assembly. If you go to them, they would always help you to acquire land for farming. And uh, getting funding, you have to use Exim Bank or get a good proposal and then assess any of the grants. The trick is you should always use, I, I prefer using social impact investments where you would probably group a group a group some farmers together, form cooperatives, you know, employ women. There's a lot of emphasis and funding for women groups. So I go to a community, the women are already doing 
they already do sogum, but I just go like, okay, I'm picking all widows and then I'm providing them assistance, buying more land and giving inputs so that they will farm on smallholder basis. A model like that should give you grants, which you may not even need to pay back. So for funding for farming, there is so much. Go to even if you go to Ministry of Agri, they'll give you. There's so much information they'll give you on how to assess funding for farming. Thank you. Then, uh, what training would a doctor need? Oh, for a doctor, you just need to read, 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 read. You are not the one going to do the farming. Currently, as I said, all you need is to engage the experts, agronomists. Make sure you engage agronomists. You can't do your farming on your... Don't engage uh, Miba Hatch or how do you call it? Those people who say I've been farming for 20... No, 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 no. Engage agricultural extension officers. When you go to the Greek offices in the district, a lot of them are employed and there is very little they do because our people don't take advantage of them. Just go... The fees, the charges are very little. You would, you would, you, you would have the expertise you need. Thank you. Is there any other question? I've not really. Yeah, someone was asking if that you could work uh, him or her through the processes of exporting crops, the non-traditional ones. Just get to GEPA, Ghana Export Promotion Authority. They handle the non-traditional crops. They, they, they are so helpful. They have every information. Cocoa Board handles cocoa, and then GEPA handles the rest of it. They handle the cashew and um, every other thing. And there is a lot of information there. What you need to know is there are standards you must meet. There are certification processes you must meet. Then there is traceability where from farm gates, they can trace your crops from where it's coming from. There are specific pesticide and uh, agrochemical levels you need to meet. Current, recently, Ghana was banned because we have high levels of agrochemicals in our pepper and vegetables. The, I, I think they've lifted a ban. But using processes like um, greenhouse, you would definitely meet all the requirements for exports. So take advantage of GIPA. Just go there or go to their website. Every information is there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dent uh, Selassie Tabaklu was asking uh, the interest loans for farming, the rates per annum. Two to five percent. It used to be two percent. But, uh, okay, you, I wouldn't go there, but now it's around five percent. Yes. At Exim okay. Bank. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Fadi. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah. so, this so question is directed. Yes. So, to answer uh, the question, mm -hmm. you want to throw more light on a various government institutions. So, Register General, you're going to register a company, district assembly for your building permit or a uh, permit for uh, to operate in that premises. Um, you've got EPA. Um, uh, fire service, HEFRA, NHIA, um, GRA, of course, Data Protection Agency. And for all of these, except GRA, there are fees that you pay. GRA would, at the end of the year, will determine how much your tax, will give you an estimated tax return that you would and break it down per quarter and they expect you to pay the amounts per quarter. At the end of the year, you file your tax returns. You're expected to file your tax return whether you make money or not. And that will tell and that will determine whether you've made a profit or a loss. The yeah, GRA may credit you if you've made a loss or if you've made a profit, they'll ask you to pay um, the difference. And then the next year, they shall adjust your target. And they do that every year. And the second part was that if you record losses in your first few years, we still have to pay taxes. Well, there's an estimated tax that we expect you to pay, whether you are making losses or not. But most importantly, you have to file your tax returns every year, profits or loss. We expect you to file your tax returns, and we expect you to do that for every single company. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Uh, Dr. Medpadi, please, I've also noticed that you've answered most of the questions in the Q&A session. 
is there any question that we you wish to throw more light on um I, I tried to answer all of them in the box in the so they're all in the answered box there are questions about whether an mo or a resident can set up an office practice and things of that sort have regulations i don't know the exact um um requirements uh with but however i do know that if you are in a government practice our regulations don't allow you to open one use your license to open a private um, um setup to the best of my knowledge um, if you are not in the government service then you can use your, your your license without any restrictions as long as it's not being used elsewhere but if you're in your government service there tends to be a restriction but you would have to check up with the hefra All right, thank you very much uh, to our presenters. You've given us so much insight into the various field, both the medical field and the great sector. And we are very pleased for such a wonderful and elaborate presentations. Uh, time is fast spent. And my able chairperson, Dr. Dr. Medaisha. Dr. Dens, very <laughs> I think time as far as spent, is there any announcement or information that yeah, you wish to give to our participants? Um, um, I will first of all want to thank both both um, speakers for a very brilliant um, presentation. Um, they actually went and dealt very well into the topics that they had been given. Dr. Ayete setting up a private practice and then Dr. Bedra, opportunities in agriculture for the medic. Um, you have um, opened our minds to the opportunities out there and um, giving us that leverage or the knowledge to um, take, up, take up our entrepreneurship uh, skills to another level and then also get other sources of income. Um, uh, from Dr. Ayete's, um, Dr. Paddy Roland Ayete's um, a presentation it was quite passionate. We understood your journey and um, looked at all the things that involved um, setting up a private practice. Um, I would want to just mention the challenges, which is the 24-7 duty. Uh, you have to generate income for others, you know, personal liability and others. But the joys seem to be also very, very good. Better return on your effort, unlimited earning potential, better return on investment. You are a master of your own destiny and you leave an inheritance. Um, for Dr. Bedra, he actually did a very good job in agriculture. He touched on almost every aspect of agriculture and talked about the importance, about 25% of Ghana GDP is dependent on agriculture. And um, all the um, uh, things you need to look out for, especially the take home I got was that you should not use your medical knowledge to farm. You should engage experts and then also do not depend on rainfall patterns. Um, irrigation is the way to go. Use the um, modern technologies, automated monitoring systems, security, you know, and then the greenhouse or the green gold is also one thing we should also look at. So um, for him, the challenges were the finances and all the, um, the unexpected, you know, challenges or disasters that can happen. You gave us the opportunities like where you could get funding and all that and actually even when to talk about budgeting, you know, so it's actually been a very insightful evening on entrepreneurship for, for doctors. And uh, I wish to thank you very much and the audience who have been on for, for all this while. And we hope that um, you would um, use what has been um, imparted. Um, for the announcements, uh, as per CPD committee rules, um, CPD points are earned uh, if you are able to take up to stay up to 50% on, on the Zoom of the time allocated for the CPD. 
you're supposed to fill your MDC points, MDC uh, ID in the right way. I mean, and then um, also is the MDC number is the only identification that is used to um, to allocate the points. So um, I do not have any other announcements, just that we have more DPDs for our members and uh, please look out for the CPDs and join. They are free, educative, and then um, they would uh, impact on, on our profession and, and our skills. Thank you, Dr. Dent uh, Brifo. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Med Aisha, for your kind words. So this CPD was powered by GMA through the CPD committee, which is under the leadership of Dr. Med APJ, aka Ronaldo. So Ronaldo, this year the annual congress, we are coming to vote again. Expect us. Have a wonderful day, ladies and gentlemen. Goodbye. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>